morning, everybody. Welcome to Southwest Baptist Church this morning. Good to see you all and, and a happy Easter to all this morning. Would you please stand as we sing number 159, Christ the Lord is risen today, please. Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, alleluia. Sing ye hymns and earth reply Alleluia Lives again our glorious King Alleluia Where all death is now thy sting Alleluia Dying Please be seated, please. And brother, I'm looking for the brother Matt, and uh, I'm not seeing brother Matt. Well, I'll tell you what, we we'll may have those announcements just a little bit later then. Uh, we'll, oh, where's brother Matt? He's coming in the final stretch here, and and. Uh, we know the name of that slow horse, if uh, old enough to remember. Do, do, do. Okay, you ready? Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry about the delay, but um, he is risen. A amen, amen. Um, we're happy to have each and every one of you here to worship our resurrected Lord and Savior today and to be with us on Easter and what it means today because <clears throat> this, is an, this is an important message uh, today because at the heart of the gospel, right, is the death of Jesus for our sins and the resurrection of Jesus. And we are just studying all this morning and, and hear, we'll hear the message today how important that is um, because that really is the heart, right? Jesus died for our sins, our personal sins, so that we can be free. And Jesus rose from the dead, proving that his sacrifice was acceptable. So let that sink into your heart today, because um, remember Jesus said he's the, the resurrection and the life, right? And all who believe in him 
Um, even though they may die, they will have life and always have life. And so how we respond to that is uh, whether uh, you know, we're a born-again Christian or not and whether we have that life. So let that sink in because at the end of our message, after Pastor George is uh, done today, we always have a time of invitation, and that's a chance for us to have you know, that response, right? So if, if it's burning on your heart, like some of the disciples, they said, do you remember how our hearts were burning uh, when Jesus was with us? Uh, that means that uh, today is your day. Today is your opportunity. So, um, but we appreciate you all being with us today, um, and especially our visitors, our guests, our family, and, re and returning visitors, um, so that we can worship together and we can show you uh, the same love of Jesus that we've come to know in our church and in our lives. So, with that said, let's open up our bulletins. I have just a few announcements here that I was noting to remember and the first one is the Bible study that we have on Wednesdays that we're doing in John um, I'm gonna call that I like the title Bible study so I'm gonna call that our journey in John so <laughs> that's what I wrote down so we're, we are doing a journey in John and we're learning all about what Jesus did and so that we can help others understand that and so we can have a better understanding of ourselves and let it be life-changing so Remember that, that's on Wednesdays. If you can't make it in person, let me know. We can always uh, uh, show you how to get on onto the, uh, the live stream of that so you can participate from home. We just want you to be able to participate and be part of our group though. And then our prayer in unity um, for this month is uh, based on Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, so let that be on your hearts as we think about others that we want to share that with. And uh, that's our prayer in unity each month that we pray for something together in the church and a unity, a corporate prayer, right? Um, together, right? And uh, so that uh, ask God to honor that. Um, and then remember um, the missions and ministry team, how we, uh, it's, it's outside of the coat closet when you come in, there'll be a little, um, um, little uh, donation bin there uh, where you can turn in um, items for the food pantry so that's ongoing and then also on Saturday May 11th at noon in Memorial Hall there's going to be the, the ladies spring luncheon uh, so that's where you can host a table the, the women of the church and um, so if you if you're interested in that you want more information <clears throat> you can mark the bulletin insert um, that you'll find in there at the bottom um, it's noted in bold at the bottom so that's the extra one and uh, so with that said regarding the bulletin if you could sometime uh, during service fill it out your name as much information as you want to put uh, we just want to know that you that you were here and then if two two important things in the bulletin is at the bottom there's some things uh, that you could mark if you want to know more information about the church or amen if you want to, uh, uh, you're interested in becoming a Christian or being baptized, um, or you just want to speak to somebody, you can note that down there too. And then the other important thing is on the back, uh, you can mark your prayer request. We pray for, uh, the deacons of the church will pray for those requests. Uh, we love to pray for you. Uh, we want to pray together and lift up your burdens up um, in agreement with you. And um, we do that um, each week. So. So share your prayer request. If there's something on your heart today, make sure you put that down. We keep those confidential, so that's not shared with the rest of the church. So we'd be happy to do that or speak with you. And um, with that said, we'll turn it over to a time of worship and song and the hearing of God's word, and we'll lift up our hearts to him who is our resurrected Savior. Let everything else uh, give all our burdens up to him so we can put this focus on him and him alone. Um, so, thank you. I kidded Matt. Sometimes he takes me too seriously. But uh, I kid him about getting up here. But seriously, uh, Matt and others yesterday showed their service here for children in our neighborhood. And I'd be remiss with it and say thank you, Diana, and all the people who organized yesterday to make it a successful event and reach some kids. Um, as different people observed, we had more people this year than we had last year. 
which is always a good thing. And uh, we're grateful for the blessings we'll see in the future on that. And Matt, you were here as part of where we went to again. I lost him. <laughs> That's me. I lost him. But uh, like I say, all of you who showed up yesterday as service, it was a blessing. Uh, I know it was a blessing to the kids and to the parents that came to yesterday too. As we continue worship, would you go to hymn number 160 at this time? And the hymn is Low in the Grave He Lay. And would you please stand once again as we sing 160? Please remain standing, and Brother Douglas will be coming to share our responsive reading at this time.
to two of them while they were walking along on the way to the country. And they went away and reported to the rest, but in did not believe them either. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we do pray and thank you for the many blessings those have bestowed upon us for this beautiful Easter morning. The weather has been perfect. We pray that you will forgive us for any of our shortcomings and praise our government, our first responders, police, medical people, and each person that comes through our front door, and also those that pass by, because everybody needs our prayers. These things we ask in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus! Thank you, Brother Tom. Uh, we appreciate your service so much and uh, encouraging us and leading us in that. At this time, would you please look around the room and uh, give a friendly wave to people you see, uh, people you know, people you don't know, and uh, make sure to make notes to make friends before you leave today that you'll have a new friend to come to church with next week. And we're certainly glad to see uh, regular people back, visitors here, and, uh, and everybody that is here, we appreciate you so much. and. Uh, Hope that you are blessed by our service today and worshiping the Lord on, on the special day, Easter. I was make sure I was giving you enough time to communicate there. So maybe one more smile around the room there. Okay. Uh, would you please join hymn number 400? And s no, I'm, I'm jumping ahead now. I'm getting so excited about Easter. I'm going someplace else. All right. Uh, mm. <laughs> would we go to the family of God? Okay. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Now we go to 407. The hymn is Because He Lives, number 407. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove. My Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still 
the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Thank you. You may be seated, please, at this time. And I believe we have some special music coming to us, and then the pastor will speak after that. Thank you so much. Well, George, thank you. Ever since I met Jesus, I've been very conscious that I am never alone, and that has always been a great comfort. Since I've become a papa, I am also never alone, and that too is a great comfort. When given the opportunity this morning to bring special music, I asked God, well, what should I sing? And um, the song that uh, has been chosen is called Above All. So pray for me. I'm still trying to remind my fingers and my voice how to play and sing after my long illness. Above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth 
and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. Rejected and alone, like a rose, splattered on the ground, you took the fall. And thought of me, above all, above all power. I'm sure Michael thought about bringing his ukulele today, but his mother wisely nixed that idea. He is risen. He has risen. And because he has risen, we are here and we have hope in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before God called me as a preacher and as a pastor, I made my living as a business consultant. And I had the opportunity to work with a lot of the Fortune 500. That includes the Walt Disney Corporation, 
And what stood out to me when I went there, I was at one of their huge mega facilities in California, was the cultural foundation of all of the people that made up the magic kingdom, the people behind the magic, how they all bought into it, how their thinking was so much beyond ours that when you ever, if you've ever gone to Disneyland or the Disney World or to Epcot or even just watch some of their animations, you go like, my goodness, I could have never thought of stuff like that. Well, Pastor Chuck, Chuck Swindoll, he met a gentleman who served on one of Disney's boards. And he had all sorts of amazing stories. He said, now, in those early days, they were really pretty tough. But that remarkable creative visionary refused to give up. Everything Walt says he wanted to do, people said, no, you can't do that. And so he said, I especially appreciated his sharing with me how Disney responded to disagreement when people disagreed with him. He said that Walt would occasionally present something that was just unbelievable, an extensive dream he had just been entertaining, and he wanted to make it happen. Almost without exception, the members of the board would go, blink, and stare back at him in disbelief, resisting even the thought of whatever it was that he was thinking. But unless every member resisted the idea, Walt Disney wouldn't pursue it. He said, if they don't resist it, if they don't think it's so amazing, too amazing to actually become reality, then my dream isn't big enough. The challenge wasn't big enough to merit his time and creative energy. Now, Jesus' disciples, they were also in agreement, in amazement and disbelief from the new, about the news that he had risen from the dead. It was a big challenge, but it was better than Disney. Jesus prevailed and convinced them. What will it take for us to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Our text today comes from the Gospel of Mark, one of the more abbreviated Gospels when it comes to the account of the resurrection. Mark 16, verses 7 and 8 says, But he said to them, Do not be amazed, for you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See, here's the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples. And Peter, I like how they added, and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Let's pray. Can you help Papa pray? Heavenly Father, we are just um, privileged to experience another Resurrection Sunday celebration. We never know when it's going to be the last Resurrection Sunday celebration before you come back for your church. But we know, Lord, that you have delayed your return because we still have work to do. And so for all of us here, whether we're here physically, whether we're listening, whether we're watching a recording, speak to us from your word today. Oh, Holy Spirit, stir our hearts that we might believe in the resurrection. Move us to that place of complete abandonment of self and what we want. And let our faith be not on our power, but on the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Change us. Let us experience a spiritual rebirth, O oh God. And for those of us that know you, that are part of your family, revive our spirits today, O oh God. That with great enthusiasm, energy, and confidence that we might tell others about you. So in your name that we do pray, amen. This passage to me is pretty straightforward. He was dead. He rose from the dead and seen as believing. He was dead. He rose from the dead and seen as believing. Mark 15, 33 through 39 described how Jesus died on the cross. I think it's very important. Considering the circumstances, it's understandable that the news of his resurrection is just really just so 
amazing. To be amazed is to be surprised, astonished, in awe, and to wonder if what we have heard or what we have witnessed is actually true. I mean, have you been in a situation where you were just so amazed, you were wondering, are my eyes tricking me? Are my ears tricking me? Is what I'm feeling or tasting, is, is, is this really real? You know, that expression, you had to pinch yourself to make sure you're not dreaming? Okay, so this is the space where the disciples were when the women came and told them that Jesus, the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen from the grave. So, Mark writes, in beginning with verse 33, when that sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard him, they began saying, look, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge filled with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, well, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry, and he died. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw that he died in this way, he said, truly this man was the Son of God, end of quote. Now, Jesus had been unlawfully interrogated the Thursday night before his betrayal by Judas. It was after the Last Supper. It was after his passion while he was in the garden praying, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. And he had begged his disciples to stay awake and to pray with him, but they all fell asleep. The Roman soldiers, resentful that they had been assigned to the tasks of crucifixion in such a backwater country as Israel, they took their frustration out on their prisoners, especially Jesus. They blindfolded him and then began punching him and mocked him to identify who hit you. They pulled out handfuls of his beard. They whipped him with a cat of nine tails and embarked, embedded with sharp stones and laid his back open and the blood just profusely began running down. They fashioned a crown made of long Judean thorns and they beat it into his scalp with a stick so it wouldn't move. By putting a purple robe on him, they mocked him again by pre pretending to worship him as the king. They made him carry his own cross. But he was so weak he couldn't do that. So Simon of Cyrene came to help him in that. Arriving at Golgotha, the place of the skull, Jesus and the others condemned to die with him on either side. Thieves, they were at the point of no return. Before they nailed him to the cross, they roughly pulled off that robe, calling the wounds, causing the wounds that had begun to congeal, to rip open and start bleeding all over again. A sign, the king of the Jews was put over his head so people would continue to mock him. What a grotesque human adornment the three of them must have been on that day. Their bodies nailed to the cross, hands and feet, would then drop into that vertical shaft, dislocating their shoulders and probably ripping the ligaments and tendons in their hands and also in their feet. They were in agony. Yes, Jesus had to die for our sin, but, heavenly certainly, but heaven certainly was not happy about it. A supernatural darkness fell over the land at noon and continued for three hours. God imputed that as he moved from the account, all of our human sin accounts, he moved that and put it in Jesus' account. So Jesus cried out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Well, God, whose continual presence Jesus had from the time he was born, now God could no longer have that intimate communion with him because God is holy and righteous. He cannot have communion with sin. That's why we cannot know God until we confess our sin and, and, and we repent from that and ask Jesus to move in and to clean us up. In his humanness, Jesus, Jesus felt forsaken, and then Jesus died. 
the long, heavy, thick veil of the temple, separating the holy place from the people, is torn in two. For Jesus' death provided a bridge to God for all who believe. We're no longer separated. We don't need priests to sacrifice for us. Jesus is our high priest, and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have no need for any other mediator. And to make certain, as noted in Matthew and Luke's Gospels, they record that the Romans pierced his side with a spear. Blood and water came out. And Luke, of course, who was a physician, a modern physician would tell you when someone has died, the blood serum and then the red blood cells, they, they, they separate. That was proof of death. And so that Roman centurion who probably had presided over hundreds of crucifixions, he said, certainly, the way he died, he must be the son of God. He was dead on Friday. He was dead on Saturday. He was dead on Sunday until he wasn't because he rose from it. Mark 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who's going to roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? That's a message all by itself. And looking up, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, don't be amazed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazarene, right? He's been crucified, but he has risen. He's not here. See, here's, here's the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you're going to see him, just as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb. Trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anybody because they were afraid. End of quote. That's a pretty real human reaction, don't you think? We don't want to judge the people in this story because we were not back in that story, but we all have our own stories, right? They came to anoint a dead man, but he had to stay still for it, and he wouldn't. The tomb was empty. An angel witnessed their amazement, another way of saying their disbelief. He acknowledged who they were looking for and confirmed the glimmer of hope that they held in their hearts. Jesus had risen from the dead. They were instructed to tell his disciples, especially Peter, and the angel promised that they would see him with their own eyes. Well, they could hardly think straight. They didn't know when or how or if that would really happen. Jesus was alive, but they were afraid to tell anyone. And I've run out of situations where I've seen things that were just so incredible that I was almost, you know, you had to be careful about who you share certain things with, right? Right? Because they'll ridicule you or they think, that, oh, okay, you know, he's a little cray-cray, all right? But they knew what they saw and what they heard. But still, they were afraid to tell anybody. Mark continues the story beginning in verse 9. After he had risen early in the first day, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, here was a woman who knew the difference between living a life in complete darkness and having no control to the peace that passes all understanding that keeps our hearts. And that's only in Christ Jesus. Jesus chose her. So if anyone tells you that women are not important to the gospel and the ministry of the gospel, just show them that verse and then tell them, when you figure it out, you get back to me. She went and reported to those who had been with him and while they were mourning and weeping and when they heard it, that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. She was an eyewitness, but they refused to believe her eyewitness account. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. Now we know these were on 
the, the two disciples who are on the way on the road to Emmaus. They went away and reported it to the rest, but they didn't believe them either. In a quote. So perhaps the events of Resurrection Sunday are the basis of the old saying, seeing is believing. Those who saw the risen Jesus, they believed. Those who only saw him die, did not. The prophets and Jesus himself told the disciples of his matter of death and that he would be resurrected. Well, why didn't they believe the prophets and Jesus' own words? Why do some of us not believe? Is a fear of ridicule? Is it a greater fear of death and not having faith that Jesus conquered death for us? What will it take for us to wholeheartedly believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Well, seeing is believing. Even though faith is not dependent upon physical evidence, faith and evidence are not mutually exclusive. The angel had shown the women proof of the resurrection by inviting them to see the place where they laid him, but they still wanted further proof of actually seeing Jesus alive. So the angel reminded them of Jesus' earlier predictions of his resurrection and the promise that he would precede his disciples into Galilee. So Mary Mag Magdalene saw him, and she believed. The two men on the road to Emmaus, after they had broken bread, after that long walk, as they're filling in the stranger of all the things that happened in Jerusalem, and, you know, I can't imagine Jesus' face while they're telling this story, right? And he's like, really? What happened next? Oh, that's, that's, that's incredible. And it wasn't until they broke bread there was something in his breaking the bread. You know, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. They recognized it was the risen Christ. The disciples, of course, were barricaded in the upper room for fear that the Romans and the high priests and their posse were going to break down the door at any moment and they were going to be next. And they didn't want to die that way. Nope, they're not open up that door for nobody. Nope, you're going to knock on the door and say, Jesus is risen. We're going to say, we don't believe you. Stop tearing felon tales. In fact, you, the Romans probably paid you to say that, so we opened up the door. Nope, go away. But now, Luke speaks on this. Luke 24, verse 38. He said to them, after he appeared... See, Jesus, I love this. He just simply just walks through the door. He walks through the walls, and he's right there in a the room with them. <sighs> Jesus? Looks like Jesus. Do you think maybe it's a ghost? Jesus? And he said, Why are you frightened? And why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look, my hands. Look at my feet. It's I myself. You can go ahead and touch me. Go ahead. Does a ghost have flesh and blood that you can feel? And then when he said this, he then showed them his hands and his feet. So they had that opportunity to see. It was then that they believed. So the question is, what does Jesus have to show you and me in order for us to believe in him? What does Jesus have to show us to not simply believe in the historical Jesus, but that he is risen from the dead and he's coming back for his church? For me, it was the testimony from the Bible from those who were eyewitnesses. Having served on a jury before, I can confirm that eyewitness reports carry a lot of weight. When I first read John chapter 1, I love the Gospel of John, beginning with nine, verse 9 through 12 as a teenager, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart from 
the scripture in a way that for the first time I could see that Jesus was real and that he died for me. John wrote, this was the true light coming into the world who enlightens every person. You know we need spiritual light to see Jesus clearly, right? He was in the world and the world came into being through him. He is our creator and sustainer. Yet the world didn't know who he was. They didn't recognize exactly who he was. And when we are invested, I find, in the ways of the world, we don't know who he is either. We're blinded because we're so much thinking about and always looking at the things of this world, the things of the flesh, the things that are going to perish. But Jesus is eternal, the great I am. When he opens our eyes, we can see him and believe in him because it's only spiritual rebirth that opens our eyes to see Jesus today. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Would you like to be born again? If you want to be born again, then come and see. Come and see Jesus. Come and see the empty tomb. Mary breast and, and Mary who breathlessly cries out, Rabboni. Come and see Mary, the mother of James, who collapses at his feet in worship. Come and see Simon, who Jesus renames Peter, and who insists on a death worthy of his Savior. Come and see the holes in his hands and in his feet, Thomas, so you know the price that he paid for you and you'll stop doubting. Come and see that your brother is Lord, James. I know you grew up with him in the same house, but your brother is Lord. James would go on to become a leader of the church. Come and see the 500 others who saw him walking around in those 40 days after he rose from the grave. Come and see Saul, killer of Christians, and be transformed into Paul, the great church leader. Come and see, teachers, that the word that you love is alive, for Jesus is the word of God. Come and see, death, that your sting is no longer final. Come and see, skeptic, the pierced hand reaching out to you right now, today. And I don't know which one of these people that you can identify with, but come and see Jesus, and he will save you. He will change you. And he would give you a destiny of hope for all of eternity. In closing, Dr. Tony Evans tells of a little boy one day who was lost and he couldn't find his way. Anybody here ever been lost? I mean, really lost? You had no idea where you were. You just, okay. He started to cry because he was so lost. That's right. You need a hug. That's right. Stranger saw this little boy crying, and he came up to him, and he tried to comfort him. He said, well, what's, what's wrong, son? And the little boy said through a flood of tears, well, I can't find my way home. Right now, every mother's like, oh, no, don't ever let this happen to my babies, my grandbabies. And, yeah, right. Is there anything near your house, the man asked, that you can remember? He thought, of, the boy thought about it for a moment. He says, well, there's only one thing I can remember. There's a building near my home that has a cross on it. The man knew ex exactly which cross the boy was talking about. So he took the boy by the hand, and he walked with him to the church. Can Papa have your hand? Oh, it's full of toys. This is another reason why we can't see Jesus. And, and we won't give him our hand because our hands are so full of things. And we live in pursuit of the material things. I guarantee you, six months, six weeks from now, we won't even be able to find this toy. He walked him to the church, the building with the cross. When the boy got to the church, he knew exactly how to find home. When he found the cross, he found home, end of quote. 
If you've ever been lost, and I have, I remember how terrifying it was. I thought I had taken the correct train to go back to my home on the south side from school. Instead, I got on the wrong train and it took me north all the way to the end of the line. I must have been at least 45 miles away from home. And this is in Chicago. So you got all that dense city in between. And I had to find something called a pay phone for you Gen Zers. You can Google it, okay? I found a pay phone, and I was really glad that I had change for the pay phone. And I called home. I can't remember if I got a sister or my mother or father on, on, on the line and told them where I was. And so they were trying to tell me how to get, you know, we'll, we'll do this and do this and do this. I was so afraid that I was frozen. And I said, will you just come get me? And so they did. They took all of those trains. They got off so they could just grab me and bring me home. Jesus left his home in glory. He became flesh and blood so that we might see the face of God. Receive his comfort. Hear his voice. Eat the fish and the loaves that he multiplied. He realized that we are too afraid, like Isaiah. He says, woe is me, I'm a man with unclean lips. I come from unclean people. I, God, I can't do anything for you. I, I can't be with you. So Jesus came down to us to get us. And he's coming back to get us. Let's pray. Jesus, in our amazement, in our doubt, and in our fear, your hand of grace is always available to us. You revealed yourself in that generation. You revealed yourself before that generation to your first covenant people. And you continue to testify of yourself and reveal yourself in this one. There may be someone here, Jesus. Right now they're lost. But pride or fear, something is in the way. Have them to cast their eyes on you and not look at their circumstances, not look at their past or the things that their friends have told them or what they've read on social media or what's on the news or their vain pursuit of things of this world. And just for this moment, look at you, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world our Savior. And if this is you, just pray this simple prayer with me. Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I have not known you or I have fallen away from following you. I have let other things get in the way. I want to take your hand. I know your hand has reached out to me and I know I'm not worthy, but so I confess my sin and I turn away from it, oh God. I believe that you rose from the dead, that you conquered death, that you satisfied my sin debt. So Jesus, come into my life 
and change me. I surrender. Lamb of God, I come. See me where I am. Meet me where I am. And Jesus, I've been running from you for a while. Oh, when I was younger, I loved you. I was baptized. But adolescence, hormones got in the way. Drugs got in the way. Alcohol got in the way. Life got in the way. Relationships got in the way. My career got in the way. Disease got in the way. Death took people that were dear to me away, and that's gotten in the way. I'm mad at you, God. I don't understand. But I want to, and I need your comfort. So forgive me and strengthen me and let me become a productive disciple again. Sing your name that I do pray. If you're here today and you prayed any, either of those prayers, if you're here today and you know Jesus, or if you're here today and you still have questions, please see me or one of our deacons before you leave today. And let's get your questions answered and help you on your next step in your spiritual journey. And maybe you're here and you're a believer and you've been looking for church home to call your own. Well, I wasn't looking when I came here, but the Spirit of God said, be here, and then lead here. If God is calling you, we would love to welcome you as part of Southwest Baptist Church. We're not gonna give you a standardized test. We're simply gonna ask you a few questions. And then we'll be happy to welcome you into this family. Once again, you can stand and come forward now or you can see me after the benediction. Let us stand for the benediction. After we are saved, we can truly say, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with great joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be power, majesty, and dominion now and forever. And the church said, amen. amen.